Good afternoon or morning to everyone joining. We'll get started in just a moment here. Just want to give people a chance to get their audio settled. All right, looks like a good critical mass to start with. So uh, welcome to today's user group. Um, before we hand it off, just want to cover a few tech things in case you haven't joined us for one of the user groups before. We're using a Zoom webinar today, which is very similar to Zoom meeting with a couple of key exceptions. The first is that your cameras and microphones are disabled by default, so you don't need to worry about interrupting anybody or being seen. But that does mean if you want to interact or ask, ask a question, you'll need to use the chat function or the Q&A function. Uh, chat is great for just general comments if you have any tech issues, so on and so forth. Uh, if you do have questions for the panel, we do ask that you put those in Q&A just because it's a lot easier to manage. You can ask those questions anonymously uh, and you can view existing questions. So um, this is just a, all around a smoother experience if you put your questions in that way. Feel free to put those in at any point, but we will address them at the end of the main presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to Julia Finaki. Julia? Thank you, Michael. Welcome everybody to the August 2022 EDGE user group. Uh, the days are starting to get shorter, but you can count on 60 minutes of good content, content from the IESC on this webinar. Uh, today's hosts are myself, Drew Carlisle, and David Mahali. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. We can go to the next slide. And EDGE wouldn't be what it is without the expertise that we utilize from the International Education Standards Council, who review and update our, our recommendations and, and comments and recommendations that come in from you all for new documents or, or edits that are needed. Um, Jasmine Saidi Kunert is the chair of the ISC as well as the founder, president, and CEO of ACEI. She is not with us today, but we do have a number of wonderful member, members here with us today, including Emily Say, Leslie Eicher, Shelby Keerley, and Robert Watkins, uh, and Nancy Katz. So welcome everybody, we're glad you're here and uh, let's get ready for some fun. Um, as you know about the IASC, it's composed of representatives from public and private institutions um, in the United States and from credential evaluation agencies. They collect research, they review, prepare, and approve anything new that comes in, anything that we're gonna add, anything that needs to be changed within EDGE. And once again, EDGE wouldn't be what it is without their um, expertise and their input for us. Um, the placement recommendations that are in Acro Edge represent a majority consensus from this IESC. All right, so we're going to start as we always start with a poll just to see who's here. Mike, can you bring up the poll for us? First question is always, are you an Edge subscriber? Yes or no? Then is this your first Edge user group? Yes or no? And what segment do you represent? Are you institutional staff? Are you an evaluation uh, with an evaluation service? Are you a government uh, employee or are you with a law firm? And while you're all looking at that, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about our agenda. It's a pretty packed agenda today, which we're excited about. We're gonna talk about India secondary grading scales. Uh, Robert's also gonna share with you a little bit about Guinea and the grading scale there and francophone considerations that you might wanna take into uh, account when you're reviewing those scales. Also, Emily Say has knocked herself out with an outstanding presentation on the IGCSE grading and notes. Uh, this is something you don't want to miss. And then we'll talk about upcoming things that are coming uh, in the near future this fall. We'll also take any questions that you might have and answer them with this wonderful group. So how are we doing on our poll, Michael? Awesome. So are you an EDGE subscriber? 97% of you said yes, thank you. We appreciate your subscription and we'll continue to work to update you on things and to keep EDGE as timely and, and up to date as possible. Is this your first EDGE user group? Well, for 82% of you, you've been here before and welcome to the 18% who it is their first time. This is a warm group and they will certainly uh, be glad to assist you in any way that is needed. 
And then what segment do you represent? Well, about three fourths of you are from a higher education institution, 20% from an evaluation service and 6% from the government. Welcome to the government uh, folks who have joined us. We're always glad to see you here as well. So that's great. With that, and now without further ado, let's go on and get into some of our content here. One of the things that Julia did mention that the IESC does is that it is by consensus that all the placement recommendations are put in there. Um, the grading scales are also something that the IESC goes and looks at when, when making these determinations. Um, that is one of those, those pieces that it's important for us to look at lots of uh, scales and examples so we can really provide that guidance to you. Um, so I think we were gonna start uh, talking about India today. Um, and I'm gonna pass this right over to uh, my colleague, Dave. Dave? Thanks, Drew. Um, so for those of you uh, who remember or have it up, the, the EDGE Indian scales, uh, there was a standard 10, which is grade 10 uh, general scale. And then there were two standard 12 or grade 12 uh, suggested uh, percentage general scales. Um, then we had uh, one scale for the Central Board of Secondary Education. And we had another scale for the um, uh, Council for the Indian School Certificate Examinations. Um, that's a lot to say. Uh, and uh, we're, we've refined it a little bit. Uh, we've uh, updated the general scale. We're going to have a state-specific scale in there. Um, as for the uh, Central Board of Secondary Education, both of those exams, the All India Secondary School Examination Certificate and the All Indian Senior School Certificate exams uh, are going to be using the same scale. This is a new scale um, that they have. It's basically divided into five sections with a with a leather grading section, and uh, we're going to further have uh, some information on uh, the non-academic subjects uh, within within those examinations and some of the. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's basically going to be a tripartite uh, scale there. Um, the uh, Council for the Indian School Certificate Examinations, which is going to encompass your Indian Certificate of Secondary Ed, which is the grade 10 exam, and your Indian School Certificate, which is the grade 12 exam, is going to um, be divided into a scale for the standard 10 and a slightly different scale for the standard 12 or grade 12 examination. So, um, uh, we used to have the same scale for uh, for both, and now it's going to be different uh, for each. But we're going to have the central or the council for the Indian School Certificate Examinations divided into two, um, and uh, I think that uh, basically covers uh, how we're going to do it. We did we did uh, make some uh, changes in the lowest percentage pass uh, for the central board scale. I know. And uh, there are going to be some other things that, that come up. It's going to be a little bit more extensive than it was uh, and, and take up a little more real estate on the edge scale. Um, it, I don't know if Leslie wanted to add anything or Drew. Yeah, Leslie? Oh, thank you guys. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, in general, we've um, not only freshened these up and, and inserted newer scales and newer information, but also increased the... Um, credential placement advice, um, the recommendations for what you actually do with the certificates and how you interpret the grades. So it should be much easier for you now if you're evaluating Indian secondary school certificates because there's just simply more information in EDS uh, than we've had before. Yeah, I just it, want to make it clear that Leslie did all the heavy lifting on this. I was just the uh, spokesperson uh, for, for, for the changes. So uh, hats off to Leslie for that one. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> And that's something that you're going to be able to see within Edge. We're going to update that here in the very near future. Um, if you uh, have been subscribing uh, using any of the alerts within uh, the new Edge 3.0 system, uh, the first time you log in following the update that uh, the big massive update that goes onto that Indian grading scale, uh, you will get a notification, a big bar across the top of your screen that says there are alerts. Um, and you can click right in there and it'll show you for all of the countries that you've decided to bookmark, in this case, India, it'll tell you if we've made a significant update there within India, click right through and you can follow right to the changes that we made. 
as Leslie said, as Dave has said, this is really going to further clarify the information in there for you and make it easier with those documents that you actually have and are trying to evaluate those secondary grades. Um, so Leslie, Dave, thank you so much for all your work on this. Uh, and everyone else, keep an eye on uh, on on edge. And for those of you that aren't yet subscribers, uh, don't forget there's that free trial that you can go check out if you want to see uh, what some of these updates are. Anything else on India or should we uh, head over to Guinea? Let's go to Robert. Oh, uh, thanks guys. Um, my, my piece is going to be very brief because we were, we're all waiting with bated breath to hear from Emily uh, and on the IGCSE grading. Uh, but very briefly, an EDGE user uh, wrote in to us to tell us that the grading scale that we had down for India, uh, for Guinea, sorry, um, was simply the 20 point scale and that this individual had encountered a 10 point grading scale. Um, I'm sure it was me in one of our meetings that flippantly then said, well, we'll just cut it in half. Um, we'll explain how to do that. Uh, and then cooler heads prevailed and uh, we decided to actually build one for you uh, and, and graphically represent the 10 point scale with the French descriptors and their English translations. Uh, so you could actually see, you didn't have to do it for yourself via an explanation, but rather actually see it um, laid out for you uh, and how to use it. Then we thought it might be a good idea to include uh, some text uh, verbiage in there that explains how to use or that you might be uh, faced with um, multiples or fractions of the 20 point scale um, that are variations. Uh, we can't name the countries for you because there are so many and, and some do it and some do not. And sometimes different institutions within a country will do it um, where they might have um, the grade out of 40 or out of 60. Um, or even drop it down to 10 as we see here in Guinea. And by the way, this is an edge right now. If you're simultaneously looking at this on a computer while your um, iPad is tuned into the webinar, you can actually go there and see that this, is, this information is actually in there. But basically we tell you um, that you simply need to convert down to, to 20 um, in order to get the equivalent grade on that 40 scale or that 60 scale. Um, we will probably make, right now only Guinea has this um, explanation um, because we haven't actually heard from anyone or seen for ourselves that um, this is duplicated in other countries. When that happens, we'll add the, the blurb in there. Um, so you'll start to see that uh, explanation in a number of Francophone countries as we, as we move forward. Right now it's, it's in Guinea and you can actually see it. And with that, I'll return it to Drew, um, for is it Emily's turn finally? <laughs> we are. We're gonna we're gonna head over and we're gonna learn a lot about the uh, IGCSEs. Um, there's a little bit to cover. Um, Emily, I'll hand this uh, I'll hand this over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So not too long ago, we received uh, an edge user query, and that was, um, "What is the grading scale for IGCSEs?" Uh, next slide, please. And um, for better or worse, when we talk about uh, British uh, pattern credentials, a lot of times there's a short answer and a long answer. So the short answer is that the grading scale for the IGCSEs is the same as those for the GCSEs. But the long answer is that uh, it depends. It depends on the board, where they're taken, and when they're taken. Next slide, please. So because of that, what we're going to do is take a step back so that we can look at everything in terms of the background and the context. Uh, the British educational system is old, to no surprise, and they like to do a lot of reforms to keep it robust, rigorous, and current. Um, and that also impacts the grading scales that we see. So uh, what are GCSEs and IGCSEs? Uh, it stands for the General Certificate of Secondary Education. Uh, the GCSE without the I um, is the national or domestic version that you will find in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. 
However, the moment you see an I or an international before it, that means that it is taken at international schools abroad and it can be referred to as international GCSEs or IGSEs. So the thing though is that if you just see the acronym IGCSEs, it is actually trademarked by one of the international examination boards that is Cambridge Assessment International Education, formerly known as CIE or Cambridge International Education. So if you say IGCSEs, you're technically referring to the version that is awarded by Cambridge Assessment International Education. Now, GCSEs and IGCSEs typically represent a completion of total of 11 years of elementary and secondary education. They were first taken in 1988 and involved from the O levels or ordinary levels. And that's a separate story altogether, which we will not get into here for um, just the purpose of clarity and simplicity. Um, it gives access to sixth form in the UK which is a stage that leads to A-levels. As far as GCSEs and IGCSEs are uh, concerned, they represent the completion of high school in the United States when we're talking about comparability. Uh, GCSEs lead to um, A-levels or studies that culminate in A-levels, which is 13 years of study, and we regard those as uh, advanced credit or AP credit, if you will, for, for those Americans among us. Next slide. So the exam boards, there are multiple exam boards that award uh, this credential. There are five national and domestic ones. There's AQA, OCR, Pearson at Excel, and then the Welsh, WJEC, and then the Northern Ireland, CCEA. Uh, if we think five is a lot, previously, uh, there were over 30 such boards in the UK. Now for the ones that award the international GCSEs, there are three, Cambridge Assessment International Education, which we talked about, also Pearson at Excel and Oxford International AQA. Oxford International AQA is fairly new. They first started awarding them in 2017 and they are a collaboration between Oxford University Press and the domestic board AQA. Uh, the next bullet point are a bunch of asterisks, uh, which is meant to uh, indicate that there is also a fourth mystery board, which we will get to later uh, in this session. Next slide. So now that we've talked about the exam boards, let's talk about the schools and the certificates as they relate to these exam boards. Uh, this may be a bit of a foreign concept for uh, those of us who are Americans in the, the group here, but each school can be affiliated to more than one board. How does that work? Um, it is based on the school selection of which subjects and syllabi they wanna teach from that board. So for example, a school may decide to teach AQA's English syllabus, Pearson at Excel's mathematics syllabus, and then OCR's Latin syllabus as an example. Um, and there are some boards they may, may only offer certain subjects versus other boards. So you will see that mix. Now students in the UK usually sit for about uh, eight to 10 subject examinations. And all boards, uh, including the ones offering the international ones, are physically based in the UK. And whether you're talking about GCSEs or IGSEs, it is representing the British model of education. Again, it's just that the international ones are offered at international high schools abroad. Next slide. So more on the international versus the national GCSEs. So. Um, to no surprise, students in the UK will mainly take the GCSEs from the national or domestic exam boards. Uh, however, there are independent or private schools that may prefer the syllabus or subject of an international GCSE board. So it is possible to have a domestic UK student with both uh, domestic and or international GCSE certificates but you won't see it the other way around, okay? Uh, you won't see an international student outside the UK with a domestic GCSE certificate. Uh, most uh, schools uh, in the UK will do the national domestic exam board versions uh, because that 
counts in the league tables, which impacts funding and whatnot. But again, the independent schools and the private schools, they have more leeway and, and may say, you know what, I like the syllabus from this international GCSE board. Let's do this subject from this board. OK, if our head isn't spinning just yet, let's uh, move on and plow through. Here's a little more context. I talked about how the UK likes to do reforms. Um, and here's the most recent set. Uh, and this will explain the grading scale a lot that you see for the GCSEs. In 2015, uh, they introduced the, a new qualifications framework known as the RQF or the Regulated Qualifications Framework. Uh, they still have eight general levels and three entry levels. So those did not change. Why did they introduce the RQF then? Uh, the main prevailing idea is that so they could have more um, outcomes-based descriptors, and then have that also align with uh, the revisions that they wanted to do in terms of the content for the GCSEs and the AS and A levels. So some had a, a full revision and others had a refresh. Um, along with this, they also introduced a nine through one grading scale for GCSEs. Previously, it was A star or A prime through G, through G excuse me, uh, but then at this time with the reforms, they also wanted to introduce nine through one. And then along with this, they also uh, wanted to decouple AS and A levels. So just quickly, the decoupling. Um, before uh, AS levels, uh, well, AS levels represent half an A level. And so you could do the AS level and then move on to the A level, which was nice uh, because in the coupled version, it breaks it up in half and makes it a bit more digestible and navigable for students. But uh, the government said, you know what? That makes it easier for the students. We want to go back to the pre-2000 version with advanced supplementary levels and make it harder by decoupling them. So you can either choose AS or A levels, but you can't use AS levels as a halfway point. Um, you have to choose one or the other. And if you do A levels, you do the full bit without the halfway point. AS levels are independent from A levels. So that's what all that decoupling is about. But we're here for GCSEs, so let's go back to GCSEs. Thank you. So as I mentioned, uh, previously it was all A star, A prime through G, uh, but then they introduced with these reforms in 2015, the nine through one grading scale which you can see um, on your right. Um, the other idea uh, with this introduction was that allows for more differentiation. So for example, the A star and A uh, could be further broken up into nine, eight, and seven, with the nine being harder than an A star. And then the B and C, which is the next tier, could be further differentiated into six, five, and four. You get the idea. A uh, four at the end of the day represents a standard pass, which is the minimum that most universities, admitting universities will be looking for. But five is regarded as a strong pass. So if you have a more competitive program or you're a more competitive institution, you might be preferring students with the five rather than the four as the minimum. So these, um, the grading scale was phased in by subject between 2017 and 2020. Um, it's not that they can just say, all right, use this grading scale. What they have to do is when they're creating the syllabus, doing the refresh or the revision, they also have to provide parameters to say, okay, this is what uh, can be, what accounts for a grade of nine, what accounts for a grade of eight, a grade of seven. So it's very meticulously done and it's phased in by subject. It just wasn't a swapping uh, one point um, implementation. It, it was done in phases. On to the next slide. So uh, what were the responses to the nine through one announcement? Because this essentially came from England. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, Previously, everyone did the A star through G, but there was a devolution and it went to, it was decentralized, if you will. So it went to each jurisdiction. So of course, England did the nine through one scale, but Wales looked at this, thought about it, ruminated and said, you know what? Nah, we're gonna keep the A star through G scale. We're very happy with it. We're gonna keep the A star through G scale and we're not gonna do the decoupling. We're gonna stick with the coupling. And then Northern Ireland, ruminated about this as well. And then they said, nah, we wanna keep the A star through G scale, we like it. But we're gonna sneak in a C star just so that there's better alignment with the nine point scale. And they kept with the coupling also like Wales. 
So everyone basically did their own thing. That's the, the takeaway from this. On to the next slide. So here is what it looks like. Um, on the far left is the A star through G scale, which is what previously all GCSEs had uh, and IGCSEs. Uh, this was retained in Wales, as we just said. Uh, the one in the middle is the new scale with that C star that, that was snuck in, as I mentioned. This was first issued in 2019 in Northern Ireland. And then on the far right, again, that nine through one grading scale that I mentioned, that, that is essentially the new grading scale for England and other places. Okay, next slide. So that was the reaction from the national domestic GCSE boards. But what about the international GCSEs and their boards? So the largest awarding body for international GCSEs uh, and AS and A-levels is Cambridge Assessment International Education. And when word came through that uh, the national domestic versions were going to change to nine through one, Cambridge decided to survey their own international schools in what 160 countries around the world. So the schools responded and the large majority overwhelmingly said, you know what, everyone knows A star through G, why mess with a good thing? Let's keep A star through G, that is our vote. And Cambridge said, you know what, let's do it. Let's just stick with A star through G. Now Pearson at Excel, they also do the national domestic GCSE. So it was an easy, well, presumably easy decision for them to switch to nine through one. And then Oxford International AQA also had nine through one. So that's what's happening on the international GCSE scene as far as grading skills are concerned. On to the next slide. So let's look at some examples here to see how this is actually uh, playing out. We have the International General Certificate of Secondary Education or IGCSE from both from June 2020 from Cambridge Assessment International Education. Now what's going on here? The one on the left has A star through G grades and the one on the right has nine through one grades. Is one a fake? Am I a liar? Am I uh, misleading you guys? Uh, no, this is the it depends, there are exceptions category. So what happened is uh, Cambridge, for the most part, with their IGCSEs are using the A star through G grading scale. But for um, certain subjects, for certain schools in a certain region within a certain time zone, they do offer the nine through one grading scale option. So I said to Cambridge, why, why would you do this? And they said, well, first of all, there's England, which uses nine through one. So uh, for those independent private schools, they have the nine through one grading scale. And then there are also uh, schools abroad that, as I mentioned, may be using a mix of uh, boards. So they might be also offering Pearson International um, GCSEs as well as the Cambridge. So it might be easier for them and their students if they all stuck to the same grading scale with just the nine through one. So for certain subjects in certain schools in a certain region in a certain time zone, uh, you may see the nine through one grading scale for Cambridge, but on the whole, they do do A star through G. So that's the takeaway for that one. Next slide, please. So this is the GCSE from uh, the Welsh board, WJEC. Uh, the one on the left was issued in 2019 and the one on the right is issued in 2020. So. Uh, again, one has A star through G and the other one has the nine through one grading scale. Why is that? There is a perfectly good reason for this. The one on the left is the one that's actually uh, being offered or taken in Wales. The one on the right with the nine through one grading scale is the one being taken in England or Northern Ireland. So there are a few tells. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So first, if you look on the one on the right with the nine through one grading scale, at the top right corner, you see Educause. So what's happening is, even though it's a Welsh board, they created a division called Educause, which will deal with the exams that are being offered in England and Northern Ireland with the nine through one grading scale. The one on the left is um, in Wales, and the big tell is that it's bilingual. You see the Welsh and the English all over the place. Um, also looking at the bottom, 
Um, you see the logo of uh, the Welsh board and th their indication of recognition in Wales. But the one on the right, again, which is uh, from the Welsh board, but being offered in England and Northern Ireland, you see also the logos for uh, the Northern Ireland board and Ofqual, uh, which means that they are recognized in Northern Ireland and England. Ofqual is the, the regulator in England. So those are some tells. Um, the other thing you want to take note is that they uh, not only put GCSE at the top, but they called it level one, level two GCSE, which seems a bit redundant, but I think, again, it's an indication that it's being um, aligned with the current uh, qualifications framework. Uh, on to the next slide, please. So what is this level one, level two business? Um, it is, again, on the qualifications framework. Uh, level one is distinguished from level two in that it is for those GCSE holders that uh, achieve less than a standard pass. That would be level one. And then level two is to designate those holders that achieve a standard pass or higher. Um, that was a bit mind boggling for me. Uh, for no other qualification do you see a split like that, but they felt that that distinction was important and it was um, split into levels one and two on their qualifications framework. On to the next slide. So here we have another example. This one is a GCSE from the board AQA awarded in 2018. On to the next slide. And then we're going to see an enlargement here with the subjects taken and the grades. So what's going on here? Because we see a mix um, of the nine through one and then the letter grades, um, where it may be confusing because AQA awards nine through one, whether it's in England, uh, Wales, or Northern Ireland. Uh, the reason why that's happening is because, as I mentioned, between 2017 and 2020, they were phasing in the 9 through 1 grading scale by subject. So during this period, it is very possible to see a mix of the 9 through 1 and the uh, ACR 3G grading scale. On to the next slide, please. And then just another tidbit, since we're talking about grades, <laughs> um, for English spoken language, uh, for the um, some of the boards, meaning AQA, as we see here, OCR, EDUCAS, and Pearson, um, they have a separate grade for the uh, speaking and listening component, which is entirely separate and independent from the recorded grade that you see on the right, which is basically reading and writing. So for the spoken language, they uh, have this separate grade uh, for an exercise that students have to do, which is basically provide a 10 minute presentation, which showcases their speaking skills and then their listening skills because they have to respond to questions that are then subsequently asked about their presentation. Uh, so with this uh, speaking and listening component, uh, they do have a separate grade that they provide, distinction, merit, pass and not classified. If they don't achieve a pass, they will be given a not classified and it will be recorded uh, on the certificate. On to the next slide. Okay, what's happening here? If you recall, when I was talking about the international GCSE boards, I had uh, a couple of asterisks to uh, indicate that there is also a fourth mystery board. Well, that fourth mystery board is LRN or Learning Resource Network. Um, they are a, a um, not a new board. They actually have been around and have been offering um, qualifications on a number of levels, uh, for example, level two, three, four, five, uh, but they've mainly been in things like business and teaching English as a second language. Uh, but what they've decided to do is also offer now a new offering, international GCSEs and ASA levels. And that started, they first started awarding them last year. Uh, LRN is recognized for their qualifications in the UK by Ofqual. And uh, UK ENIC did do a comparability uh, statement saying that their international GCSEs are equivalent to the domestic GCSEs. So um, be on the lookout. You may be receiving LRN international GCSEs as well. On to the next slide. 
So back to the grading scales, which was the original question that brought all this on, <laughs> um, which was the what is the grading scale for the International uh, General Certificate of Secondary Education? We did not have it uh, spelled out, so to speak, um, in EDGE, uh, because uh, we sort of assumed that people would just know to go to the UK um, uh, education country profile. But now what we've done is, in addition to having GCSE, we actually put in International General Certificate of Secondary Education there so that it's clearly labeled. You still have to go into the UK country profile to find it, um, but we believe this is most appropriate here because um, it is a British pattern credential that just happens to be offered abroad. Um, we will be creating and we are working on an international section for international credentials in EDGE, um, but that's still in the work. So in the meanwhile, uh, you'll have to go to the UK profile. So here, the, uh, these are the A star through G uh, grades, which um, were previously awarded and still awarded by uh, Cambridge Assessment International Education and in Wales. Um, so you'll see the um, US equivalent grades here on the uh, right hand column. As we mentioned, C is the standard pass, so anything below that we regard as an F. Um, a star it was created to differentiate from A grade performers as the top, top performers among the top performers, if that makes sense. Uh, the cream of the crop, if you will. Okay, on to the next slide. And then, of course, the nine through one, which is the um, current grading scale or prevailing grading scale domestically. And then you'll also see on the international GCSEs from Pearson, uh, Oxford International AQA, and LRN. So again, 987 is an A, 6 is a B, 5 and 4 is C, and then the rest are F. Because again, 4 is a standard pass, so what's below that we would regard as an F. 9 um, was created to, again, to differentiate even the, the more higher achieving performers among the high achieving performers. Uh, next. And then of course, this is only in Northern Ireland. I mentioned the A star through G or A prime through G with that C star stuck it, snuck in. Um, this is only found in Northern Ireland. Um, CCEA only offers GCSEs in Northern Ireland and not in England or Wales. Um, so um, this is the uh, comparability uh, grading scale that we offer here. Basically it's the same except for C star, we made equivalent to a USC. Next slide. So the general takeaway um, for the international GCSE boards, uh, Cambridge is going to be A star through G with some exceptions, which we talked about. In some places you might see the nine through one, but on the whole, it's A star through G. Pearson, nine through one. Oxford International EQA, nine through one. LRN, nine through one. Uh, for the national domestic GCSEs, AQA, OCR, and Pearson will be nine through one. Uh, WJEC, which is in Wales, it's going to be A star through G, but when you see them in England and Northern Ireland under their EDUCAUSE division, it will be 9 through 1. And then again, finally, CCA in Northern Ireland, and only in Northern Ireland, it's going to be A star with, through G, but with a C star. Next slide. So I, that's the long answer. Back to the short answer. The short answer is, bottom line, there are two main scales you'll see on the IGCSEs, which is what the original question was. So depending, you'll see 9 through 1 or A star through G. And then again, if we're talking about Northern Ireland, there is the A star through G, but with a C star. And that's the short answer version. Thank you very much to that EDGE user for that query. That concludes our IGCSEs. My goodness. Wow. Like a huge round of applause. Everybody feel free to clap right at your desk for nobody else hears because that was amazing, Emily. Very, very valuable, as I think we saw through the chat. Um, and just phenomenal. So thank you. And um, yes, as uh, Mike Sisson did mention, that is going to be made available later on. Uh, so it just hasn't been put up yet. Right. And now you see, too, what I said at the beginning of the value of our IESC members and all the great work that they do. And so this is phenomenal, and we will have EDGE updated to reflect this as well. So thank you, Emily, for all that good work. And to all the, the IESC members who have presented today, 
Um, now we'd like to just go on to talk about a few highlights and upcoming events before we get to the Q&A. Um, and please, once again, if you have any questions about the content that was presented, or if you have a question about something else, please drop it into the Q&A section, because that is where we are going to go for the questions. Do you guys know that uh, the Guinea conversation that uh, Robert referenced earlier today, that was that was a Q&A from the last Edge webinar. That was a question that came in from someone that was attending, and it sparked some research, and it sparked going you know, deep down the rabbit hole. And, and that is the type of thing that, uh, that we get out of these, these questions. And so when you submit things to us, um, it's really helpful when you provide those redacted documents so that we can look and really get all the way down into the nitty gritty. Like Emily needs to look at uh, all of these grading scales on the documents if she's really going to put that presentation together for you. Right, right. And so, uh, yes, please. This is where we get our, our, you know, we know what to talk about and there's always plenty to talk about, but it's from you all. So please keep, keep doing that. Um, Mike, if you want to go on to the next slide. So I wanted to mention this, uh, our good colleagues at IIE asked us to share this with you, this information and the link to this survey with you. Um, this has to do with the survey that IIE does. And since its founding in 1919, um, IIE has conducted basically an annual consensus of international students in the United States. Uh, that product is called Open Doors, which probably a lot of you have used in your work that you do. And it really gives that comprehensive analysis of international students in the United States. For the first time, they are launching um, the International Students with Disabilities Surveys. Uh, they're conducting this with the support of the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State. The purpose of the survey is to identify the availability of data collected and reported on international students with disabilities and how higher education institutions in the United States support these students. So this survey, uh, unfortunately, is only open until tomorrow, but I encourage you and if it's not you to uh, send this information to whoever would be in charge of filling out a survey like this to that person at your institution. Um, we really help to support um, IIE and it's with your help in filling out these surveys that we can really generate a robust set of data um, for the open door surveys that they do. So we are grateful for your participation and we strongly encourage it. And uh, folks, I've uh, I've just checked, and it looks like that QR code mistakenly goes to um, the TICEP uh, conference registration site. We we're going to be talking about TICEP a little bit later on today, um, but apologies for that. Um, the the deadline for this IIE survey is still. Uh, tomorrow. So uh, you can go to open doors and you can find more information on that. Um, but as you see, we will have a QR code that'll take you directly to the uh, registration site for TICEP, which you'll hear more about in just a little bit. On the next slide. Yes. So please go to open doors at IIE.org to do this survey. Next slide. And here we will talk about ACRO staff going to TICEP, the TICEP conference. TICEP is the Association of International Credential Evaluation Professionals. Um, their annual conference is coming up in October in Glasgow, Scotland. And this is after um, a hiatus of a couple of years of in-person meetings um, due to COVID. And right there below is the correct QR link for the TICEP conference. Um, we will be presenting at, uh, ACRO staff will be presenting at the TICEP conference and at a Stroud is going to conduct a pre-conference workshop on credential evaluation. Uh, Dave Mahali and I will be presenting sessions on India and Myanmar. Um, and also a number of the IESC members will also be there presenting and um, making the conference happen. The conference takes place from October 17th to the 20th. It's a great chance to join your colleagues and really talk about all the things that are going on in international credential evaluation. And I don't know if any of the IESC members want to say anything here or uh, Yeah, I was going to see else. if Leslie or if Emily were going to be going to TICEP and had anything to, uh, to add to what was going to be going on. <laughs> I'm just going to put them right on the spot. 
Yeah, I'll be at the TICEP conference too presenting. And um, just as an FYI, they did extend their early bird uh, conference rate to September 1st. So uh, that's something to definitely be mindful of uh, as we are all watching the dollars. And all I can say is that I don't get to go this year. So I'm going to turn my camera off while I cry. <laughs> I'm not either, Leslie. I'm right there with you. <laughs> I, won't, I won't be going either. The week before, however, I will be in. Groningen uh, for the GDN conference. Very nice. All right. Well, there will be lots of wonderful sessions there. Um, and so we invite you to join us there. Um, also, I'm not sure, uh, Sisson, Mike Sisson, that we don't know that it's at Hogwarts. That train could be going anywhere. So just want to say that. <laughs> um, next slide. Also, ACRO has a um, Healthy library of on-demand learning, especially when it concerns the international topics in the international series. And you'll see there that these are available anytime. You simply go on there and download them and get them. Um, there is uh, a QR code where you can explore the courses that are offered. Um, and they do utilize an interactive approach and they do, you can earn your badges. Hey, Julia. Yes. There was there was a question I saw floating through the chat just a while ago uh, in between all of the fun emojis that were celebrating Emily's presentation that was looking for information that maybe we would recommend for a novice evaluator. Um, what in this on demand learning series would be right for that ask? Well, everything would be great, but I would go first to the international credential evaluations, the foundations that one. I think there's a there's an image of it in the bottom right corner. Um, of the little images that are there. That would be a great start. And then you could certainly follow it up with the Acro International Series on exam-based systems for freshman admission. Uh, two good ones that would really give you sort of the sound foundation that you would need to build on. Thanks, Drew. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what we've got next. The Gloria Nathanson Fund. We talk about this at every Ed user group and really because it's such a great opportunity for any of you out there to do the sort of research that we're always looking for and always wanting to uh, see our members and, and those interested in international education do. So look there, we can award up to $1,000 to support travel expenses, research efforts, um, any direct costs related to your research. And really, um, you've got a lot of people too that you could go on to and ask questions of and, and ask to support you in this endeavor. So if you have the time, you have the inclination, this is something to seek out in doing that work. Next slide, and I think we're at Q&A now. We are indeed. I'm going to let you all talk amongst yourselves, Drew, as I go in and we can check out what's in the Q&A and anybody else that wants to give me a hand with look, looking at what's in there and yeah. anybody that has an answer to any of those questions. Well, um, one of the things that we were talking about uh, with all of these grading scales, um, the IESC actually has had uh, some conversation about uh, grading scales in general. Hey, Leslie. Um, would you pop on here and talk about some of the, the things that we're just considering for all of the, the folks that are really trying to use this information when they're applying it to specific credentials? Absolutely, Drew. That was an interesting conversation. We were talking about grading philosophies, and that came up because of the idea of an A+. Plus. And it led to one of those conversations among the IESC members that are always so interesting and kind of a lively debate. Um, but in the end, um, we decided to change our philosophy and move away from the comparable U.S. credential of A+. So over time, um, as we work this through, the A-pluses from our suggested U.S. comparable grades will disappear. The reason for that is we feel that, we felt that, we all agreed that while there are instances of grades higher than A in the US, which is still our basis for comparison, um, it's, not, it's not a consistent one. Um, mostly we see four scales. The scale goes up to an A with quality points of 4.0. So we were like, well, but how do we indicate the, the top performers? Because you saw in Emily's 
uh, presentation that there are grades higher than A. There was the A star, there was the nine for those IGCSEs and GCSEs. And we decided that um, for our institutional users, especially um, indicating A plus puts you kind of in a quandary um, because your scale, you know, probably might maybe end at 4.0. And um, so my contribution to that, my thought process on that was in my position doing graduate international credential evaluation at Seattle U is when I see grades that are higher than um, an A, basically in the international scale, when I change it to the US comparable scale, I may end up splitting that A range. So I may have a top, top, tippy top um, grade of 4.0, and then maybe a 3.9 below that, and another A with 3.8, depending on how far you want to get into splitting that A range. Um, but yeah, that's what we decided. Um, so the A plus is saying goodbye um, in Edge from here on out, maybe not immediately, but over time as we change our profiles. Yeah, it, it really is in an effort to keep it on that 4.0 scale, which is that basis of comparison here in the United States. And so we had a few questions, Julia, we, we talked amongst ourselves, what are we going to talk about now? Well, let's, let's go ahead and, and keep in the same sort of vein with Matthew's question. And that is, what would you recommend for schools admitting students based on high school GPA? For instance, a British student may pass five subjects, but the GPA equivalent may be lower than the admission requirement. Let's see, who, who's from an institution that might want to answer that? I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, first of all, um, when we would do Acro Institutes and we would touch on uh, Britain, um, we would say, generally speaking, look for at least five GCE passes, GCSE passes, and that they have be distributed, much the way the NCAA and their uh, uh, international guides recommend an English or language arts, um, uh, math, science, social science, and another academic subject, such as a foreign language or economics or another social science or what have you. Um, so, so now the, the, and so the question that, that you raised though about GPA, don't forget the grading that Emily <laughs> took us through so deeply, that grading is not the same as, as US grading. You go to your charts and see how we've suggested that you line those up and see what the equivalent grades are. And, it, and you may be right, uh, Matthew, that, that in the end, the GPA you derive from that is going to be lower perhaps than what they got year for year in grades nine, 10, 11, what have you. Um, just a reminder that um, the, the year for year grades and, and, and certainly in the UK and generally speaking in Anglophone countries are far less important than the final exams that they take. The GCSEs, the IGCSEs, the A-levels, the AS levels, um, all that study year for year is doing in those grades and assessments, helping students get an idea of where they stand in the subject matter um, uh, and enable them to get ready for those examinations. It all leads to those examinations and that's what you use. That's what UCAS uses for placing students in post-secondary education in the UK. So think more in terms of what, how they did on the exams. And yes, if they did a little bit lower um, than they seem to have done year for year, you might want to subjectively take that into account uh, as you're weighing admit or deny decisions. Thanks, Robert. Um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna continue in this vein with, with questions regarding grading. Um, as, as has been said often in this in this field, that grading is probably one of the most problematic issues we deal with and one that we can talk about ad nauseum and can be talked about ad nauseum. So the next question we have uh, comes from Marie, who says there are these are regarding potential applicants to master's programs. One, I have seen institutions with a 5.0 grading scales and others with a 4.0 grading scale? Should they be evaluated differently? Two, I noticed the comment about Ghana graduate programs admitting second class upper 
and above students, but some US institutions have admitted second class lower students. Do you have any additional comments on that? E.g., does a GPA come into play in these decisions? There, there's so much to say here. I'll just start it off with, um, if a grading scale is different, you still need to look at how you would concord each of the grades to begin with. And so, yes, you probably would concord. Uh, uh, um, the grading scales would break out differently if you had a 5.0 or a 4.0 scale. But in either scale, the 5.0, if it's the highest, it's the highest. And if the four point is the highest, then it's the highest. Now from there, there's so much more that can be said. And rather than listening to me, I'm going to open it up to the rest of you all, uh, hosts and panelists that might want to put in two cents worth, certainly about the second class upper and lower as well. Julia, thank you. Um, I did want to actually go back to the four versus five scale for a minute. And just say that um, even, you know, even when we see grading scales that look a lot like the U.S. scale, they aren't necessarily the same as the U.S. scale. And so if you if you look at our U.S. scale with its 4321 grades and you look at a Ghanaian or a Nigerian scale with a 54321, you see that you, you do need to convert. And the reason for that is because the Ghana's students university has just used uh, oh how how to explain this um, we want to take their five possible grades and squish them into our us four scale so it does take a little bit of uh, mathematical gymnastics to do that but it's like any other grading scale that we're making a conversion on that five has to be moved down into the US four scale in order to do an accurate conversion. I mean, we're still talking top grade of A, bottom grade of C, okay, for those two scales, but we are pushing them down the Ghanaian scale to fit into the four scale for uh, comparison of US. And about the, um, the second class upper versus lower, if I understand your question right, you are asking um, if a university in Ghana only admits to bachelor's programs, uh, sorry, to, to postgraduate programs, second class upper and higher. Do I have to do that too? Not necessarily. We have a broad range of types of institutions in the United States with um, varying rigor of their admissions requirements. And so you don't necessarily need to always do um, what the international institution is doing in terms of grading. That's up to the US institution to decide. And I'll, I'll add in to what Leslie just said there. Um, I've worked at two institutions with two different philosophies on admissions to graduate school programs. And one is very strict that you have to have a certain GPA minimum requirement even to be eligible for admission. Whereas the institute that I'm at, uh, the institution that I um, do evaluations for currently is a little bit more flexible and it doesn't necessarily say you have to have a 3.0 or a 3.5 whatever to get into a master's degree they look at a little bit more than that so even if this person had a second class lower um second yeah second low lower they would still be eligible for consideration not necessarily that they would be admitted but it really does depend on what your institution's philosophies are okay i see we're getting close to time um I would like to make sure Drew and, and such, we keep some of these questions and we, we go ahead and answer some of them at our next edge user group, but I'm gonna go ahead and take um, uh, one more because I think it all relates to what we talked about today. And that is uh, Kaylee Zhang has a question of, since G IGCSC is equivalent to US high school, we can admit student based on that certificate as a freshman. That's a question. If they are still in high school, do you require the A-levels as a completion of high school also? Emily, would you like to take that one? Robert? I'll do it. Um, oh. First of all, most US institutions do not require A-levels. Uh, I know that UCLA did. I think they still might. Um, and they certainly give credit for them. We give credit for them here at UT Austin, as do all my colleagues that are at institutions uh, on today's webinar, and most of you listening in. Um, the, uh, so the question becomes, if they, if you've already determined high school graduation with the GCSE or IGCSE, 
what what to do with the A level. Well, from our standpoint, it it would be like say um, AP exams or IB exams in progress out there somewhere. If you know they're doing it, we would require that they um, that they submit that documentation. They will be barred future registers registration if they don't produce it. They've already gotten in. We've already determined high school um, uh, graduation equivalency and A-levels will not add to that other than giving them some advanced credit. But now we know about it. Now we know it's out there. We're going to require it or we're going to need to have them come back and say, oh, I changed my mind and I didn't sit it and I'll need some sort of uh, proof to that. So um, that's the way, Kylie, I would, I would approach that question. Okay, and I apologize. I see we're at the top of the hour, just like that. Um, and I would love to answer the rest of these questions. Um, Drew, can we make sure that we take these questions and uh, keep them? Uh, yeah, I've uh, I've gone ahead and I've captured some of those there. And like I mentioned before, um, your guinea slide that uh, you saw earlier today that Robert talked about. That's a direct result from the question. So thank you so much for submitting those questions. Um, and uh, we'll see you the third Thursday in September. Yes, and hang on, I've got a couple more things I just wanna say, and I wanna address the next slide real quickly. Yep. And to say that these questions are great questions. If you could advance the slide, Michael. Um, uh, keep going. Here, join the conversation. Take those questions that you had that weren't answered please, and join the International um, Activities Group. Um, right there's a QR code to get on there. Put those questions into the International Activities Group. You see that QR code right there? You can scan it by all means, and we will try to get to those questions, and, and your uh, colleagues and peers will also see those questions in that group, and they can answer them as well. And, and the last. Free. Yes, and it's free. <laughs> um, subscribe to our Active Connect letter as well and open your Edge subscription for you very few people that didn't have one. And then the last page on our slide deck is really just the QR codes to many of the things that we've talked about here. We encourage you, if you have a specific question or an update on Edge, to fill out the, uh, to, to go into Edge and uh, send an email. But please, please, please add documents, redact them first, and then send them to us. Thank you all at 301. Have a great day and a great weekend.